This week marks 50 years since Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong took a one small step onto the moon's surface, and NASA is now looking to do it again. There are plans in motion to return astronauts to the moon by 2024 under a program dubbed Artemis. The program was announced in April and seeks to not only send people to the moon within the next five years, but to also sustain a human presence by 2028. Joining us to discuss plans for revisiting the moon and the anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission is friend of the show, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Great to see you, sir. Thank you. It's great to be here. All right. What's the mission? What's the plans? So we're going back to the moon sustainably, as you already mentioned, um, but we're doing it with an eye for Mars. So we want to go to the moon again sustainably. What does that mean? That means we want to be able to stay, but not necessarily have a 1.0 human presence on the surface of the moon forever but in fact to have access to any part of the moon anytime we want. So when we go back to the 1960s, we landed on the moon six times, uh, 1969 to 1972 with 12 people, and we learned a whole lot about the equatorial region of the moon. Hmm. And because of that, we thought the moon was bone dry. In 2009, 40 years after Apollo, we discovered hundreds of millions of tons of water ice on the south pole of the moon. Water ice represents life support, air to breathe, water to drink, and rocket fuel. Oxygen and hydrogen is, is rocket fuel, same rocket fuel that powered the space shuttles, available in hundreds of millions of tons on the south pole of the moon. How did we miss that? Well, we didn't have access to the entirety of the moon. Hmm. So I will tell you there are other things about the moon that we still don't know and we need to learn. So we need to have access to the entire moon, but we also need to develop the technologies and the capabilities to go to Mars. And the president has been clear. Um, our goal is Mars. The moon is a waypoint on the way to the destination. And so the moon is basically a stepping stone to be able to get to Mars. How does it enable that journey? So we have to learn how to live and work on another world using the resources of that world. And the moon is the proven ground. So um, we can do long duration missions to the moon. Uh, and we can learn how to sustain life on the moon using the resources of the moon, ultimately so that we can go to Mars and do the same thing. And one thing that you've been talking about is the goal of having a woman astronaut set foot on the moon. Why is that important to you? So just from a personal perspective, uh, I have an 11-year-old daughter, and I want her to see herself as having all of the opportunities I saw myself as having when I was growing up. Um, so I think that's an important aspect of this mission. You know, in the 1960s, we had amazing astronauts, and we love Apollo. But there were, all of the astronauts came from fighter pilot backgrounds or test pilot backgrounds, and there were zero opportunities for women in those days. Um, this time when we go to the moon, we have a very diverse, highly qualified astronaut corps, 38 astronauts, 12 of them are women. So this time we have an opportunity to go back um, with not just the next man, but the first woman. Um, and, and the vice president gave us direction at the last National Space Council. He said, go to the South Pole, because that's where the water ice is. Hmm. Um, again, the, the reason you asked why it's so important, a lot of people don't, don't realize Earth and Mars are in very different orbits around the sun. So we're only on the same side of the sun once every 26 months. Hmm. That means when we go to Mars, we have to be willing to stay. The, the value of the moon is that it's a three-day journey there and a three-day journey home, and wherever the Earth is around the sun, the moon is with us, which means we can use it as a proving ground. Um, and, and, and the other value of the moon, uh, and we, we, we proved that with Apollo 13. A catastrophe happened on the way to the moon. They were still able to make it home safely because it's a, a, a three-day journey. If something like that were to happen on the way to Mars, it would have been over. So we need to use the moon to prove how to live and work, prove the technologies, prove the capabilities, but ultimately use it as uh, the proving ground for ultimately going to Mars. Now, the, I know the next one, why is Mars so important? <laughs> well, actually, okay. I, was, I had another question on the diversity. Yes, and then the next question after that okay. is why is Mars important? But has the president expressed an interest in a diversified um, astronaut corps? Is that something that he has specifically said to you? Well, it was uh, by direction of the president to the vice president. Mm -hmm. And the vice president announced it at the last National Space Council. And the vice president was clear, um, within five years, we want to send the next man and the first woman to the moon. And he said, um, uh, the, the next man and the first woman on the moon 
will in fact be Americans. So he sees this as a contest and he wants to make sure that Americans go next. What has taken so long for us to go back there? What has been the, you know, multiple decades long wait between the last moon landing and the next planned one? It's been the politics. Um, going, going back to the 1990s, we had the Space Exploration Initiative and it took too long. And because it took so long, um, administrations change, budgets change, Congresses change, and it gets canceled. Mm, the money gets pulled. That's right. And then looking at the early 2000s, we had the Vision for Space Exploration. Again, an effort to go back to the moon, onto Mars. Uh, it took too many years. Administrations change, budgets change, Congresses change. Right. So the difference is this time, what the president and the vice president have said is, how do we retire the political risk? Well, you, we can, NASA is really good at retiring technical risk. It's the political risk that we haven't been able to deal with very well. Well, you retire the political risk by going faster, by getting there sooner. Um, and so they have accelerated the timeline. They have amended the president's budget request to achieve the goal of accelerating so that we will have uh, the first woman on the South Pole of the Moon in 2024. So here's the Mars question you anticipated. How do you make the case to the American people? Because I'm sure it is not cheap to yeah. make it to the moon and then on to Mars. It's going to cost a lot of dollars at a time when you have a lot of problems here. You have crumbling infrastructure. You have people who don't have health care. You have schools that are crumbling. How do you make the case that this expenditure is worth it? There's a many, many different ways, but to start, it's, it's science. Um, beyond the science, we're no kidding talking about elevating the human condition in ways that nobody ever even saw during the Apollo program, and yet we're benefiting it from it today. People watching this on the internet, if you're from rural Oklahoma, I come from Oklahoma, you're receiving this probably via internet broadband from space. That's one example. But going back to the science, in the last year, we have discovered complex organic compounds on the surface of Mars. The building blocks for life exist on the surface of Mars. They're not on the moon at all, zero, but they're on Mars, all over Mars. We have discovered that the methane cycles of Mars are commensurate with the seasons of Mars. Again, increasing the probability that we could find life on a world that's not our own. The third major discovery within the last year is that we have found liquid water 12 kilometers under the surface of Mars. What do we know about liquid water? Anywhere it exists on Earth, there's life. I'm not saying there's life on Mars, but we should find out. We also know because of spirit and opportunity, curiosity, um, these rovers that we have on Mars, we have learned that Mars had in its northern hemisphere an ocean. Two thirds of the northern hemisphere of Mars was covered in ocean, and it, in fact, had a, a thick atmosphere and a hmm. strong magnetosphere. In other words, Mars used to be a lot like Earth. Hmm. So by studying Mars, we can learn about our own planet, because as you know, our planet is in fact changing significantly, as Mars has changed significantly and continues to change. Mars is always changing. So um, we need to do it for the science, we need to do it so we know more about our Earth. But the economic question, I think, when we do exploration, is, is a question that I get a lot and a, lo a lot of people are not aware. I mentioned DirecTV, uh, or I mentioned internet broadband right. from space. DirecTV, right. Dish Network, XM Radio, uh, the way we communicate over the horizon um, when, it, when it comes to sending high resolution motion picture images, like many people might be receiving this, all of that um, is a technology, those are technologies developed by NASA. Um, of course, they've been commercialized, privatized, they've elevated the human condition. People now have more access to more information than ever before. But it's not just communication, it's navigation. GPS, again, produced by NASA. That technology produced by NASA, now operated by the Department of Defense. Communication, navigation, the production of food. We're increasing crop yields, in some cases by 25%, reducing water usage also by 25%. And, and preserving nitrates in the soil so it doesn't dirty the water for humans to drink. But producing, crop, or producing crops, um, developing energy in a clean way, safe for the environment. We can detect from space every time there's a methane leak from a drill, um, those kind mm. of capabilities. Uh, and then, of course, the, 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 the way we predict weather, yeah. the way we understand climate, all these well, are NASA technologies. And to that point, I mean, you talked about the way that Mars changed and the way that the Earth is changing. What is NASA's role in terms of um, studying and dealing with climate change? So what we do is we sense the Earth in every part of the electromagnetic spectrum all of the time. And if you look at how the United States of America is doing it um, and you compare us to the rest of the world, 
Um, look at our partners on the International Space Station, for example. We have 15 countries on the International Space Station. Um, the European Space Agency, Russia, Canada, Japan, you add up all of their, all of their GDPs and they're, they're more than the GDP of the United States and yet the United States of America spends an equivalent amount to the rest of them combined. My point is this, NASA is committed to studying the Earth. We always have been and we will continue to be. Um, and we are spending right now as much money as we ever have studying the Earth, which I think is an important mission. But the goal is this, we, we take the data, the science, the information that we receive, and we share it with the world online for free. Yeah. So everybody has access to so it. So recently a, a State Department intelligence analyst resigned after the White House blocked their testimony, providing evidence and data to back up the fact that climate change could be a national security threat. I mean, as someone who's, who's running NASA, does that concern you at all, that kind of blocking of climate science? So I, that has never been my experience at all, zero. I can tell you as a Navy pilot, um, you know, you look at the polar ice caps, um, look, look, look at, you know, the Arctic ice. It's melting. It's not there. And so we are having to defend territory as a nation that we never used to have to defend. And um, in fact, our enemies are, are able to operate in areas that where, where they never used to be able to operate. Now, that's just a fact. Yeah, there's so, jockeying p for position there. That's never been the case before. That's, that's exactly right. So it, it, is, it is real. The Earth is changing. Um, the, the other thing that's important to note is NASA is studying it, and we're sharing the data with the world. And it's not just the Arctic ice. Um, there's all kinds of things we still don't know. Um, right now, because of the increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the Earth is greening. And mm. when the Earth greens, that actually has a cooling effect. At the same time, when the Arctic ice melts, uh, the water is blue as opposed to the ice, which is white, so more energy gets absorbed. So that actually has a warming effect. So there are all these feedback mechanisms that, quite frankly, we don't fully understand yet. We talk about precipitation, uh, more water vapor in the atmosphere because the temperature is a little bit higher. That water vapor is the strongest of the greenhouse gases, but it also releases energy when it precipitates. So th that's a feedback mechanism in itself that we need to understand better. So NASA is doing the science to understand all of these processes, um, ultimately so we can make the world aware and then policymakers can, can make good decisions. I will also share do with you, you. Do you doubt, though, that overall um, global temperatures are rising with you know, massive impacts that we're already seeing around the globe and here in the US? There, there, that's uh, not disputable. Yeah. Um, I will also tell you, you know, and um, Mars is very different than the Earth, uh, but the polar ice cap on Mars is also melting. So there mm -hmm. are other feedback mechanisms here. Um, orbital physics matters. The closer you are to the sun, the warmer your planet will be, whether you're Mars or, or the Earth. Um, and in fact, solar cycles matter. So the sun sometimes is warmer. It's on an 11-year cycle. So sometimes the sun is warmer. Sometimes it's, it's, it's not as, as warm. So all of these things feed into the entirety of what causes these changes. Know this, the Earth is changing. I will also tell you unabashedly. And humans are causing it? I will tell you unabashedly that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and humans have put more of it into the atmosphere. So that is one of, one of the elements in the mix causing these changes. Um, so NASA is studying it and we will continue to study it. It's our job to study it. Well, I will also tell you what we don't do is we don't get involved in prescribing policy solutions to what we're learning. Sure, that's not your job. If the right. president were to block that research or the distribution, the public distribution of that research, what would you do? Would you resign? Uh, the president never has. And in fact, right now, we are spending as much money on, on earth science as we ever have. And that was signed into law by the president. Great to have you. Thank Always. you so much. Great to have your perspective. You bet. We'll have more rising after this.